Okay, everything we touch in the universe is considered matter. A table, a car, clothes, we wear, even our own body, the list is endless. Water is a good example. For once, we are made up of a lot of water. We talked about that. Up to about here is all water. It's a lot of water in my body. That's why I gotta drink that water. Because I'm sweating, I'm peeing, and all the other stuff, and all the water I lose, I gotta replenish. And that's about two quarts a day. That's why I have you do the two quart thing. Um, also, water comes in different forms depending on its temperature. Below zero Celsius, water will become ice. Above, it will become steam. Choose all that apply describing the three states of matter. Which one? Three. No firm, no elusive. No, no. not elusive, definitely not elusive. You got that, huh? Good. Energy manipulates, this is on here. This is the concept question. Energy manipulates matter. Now, how are the concept question going? Okay, there was only two this time, huh? Yeah, yeah thank God. Uh, and you're interacting with other, I'm seeing some of you interacting with other people. I wanna make sure somebody explains something well and helps you out with it because these things, my aim is with the concept questions that you, these are the more kind of the little things that I find a bit more important as concepts. And if you interact with other students and you read somebody else's and you, you know, have some thoughts about that, uh, it helps the study, it helps the understanding. Because the way we study this material, we understand it, and once you understand the concept or something, you gotta put, you put it on a flashcard or in some format of note taking that you remember that understanding of what you have. Okay, but if you don't, because if you don't understand it and just study it, then you might as well call me and say, dude, I need to get a little more help with this. Because it's, it's not, that's besides, we can't, then it, it's gonna, then if you don't understand it, the information just goes right back out of your brain as soon as you stop looking at it. All right, anyway, enough talk of that. I guess I had too much coffee. Energy manipulates matter. For example, making tea requires heating up water. It is energy such as from a stove that will do that. Energy is flowing and hard to contain. If it is in action, we call it being kinetic. If it is stored for later use, potential energy. Give two examples how that applies to your body. So what in a body could be a kinetic energy form? Um, exercising. exercising, so muscle contraction, that's kinetic, that's in motion, energy in motion. Another example? All that muscle stuff, right? All that doing sort of thing. Uh, what about the other one? What about um, what about potential energy? Watching TV. City. No. What, what what example do we have in the body? It's an example of potential energy. I don't know, read something about ATP uh, or something. ATP. There you go. Yeah, like the A ATP is chemical chem the chemical energy molecule. So it's just sitting there. It's like a battery. When you need to turn on the light, then you can use that to make your muscles move. But wouldn't it be considered like sedentary as you're sitting until you use it, right? Even though it's still <clears throat> good. Because it's not moving. Yeah, but it, yeah, but we're not using the word sedentary. You have it, but you're not using it. Like right now, we have energy, but we're just sitting. Right. But that's how I was able to remember it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's def I definitely understand the concept. It's just we, we use it more as like it's potential, it's ready to go so versus... Like a that's turned on but not moving. Yeah. Like yeah, that's day. like it's an idol. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Or it's like the adiposite, the fat cells. You know, there's energy storage. You've got to change it chemically and then make energy out of it if you don't have enough energy coming from the food source. Okay. And then we can use that, for example. So the battery... The fat cells, that's kind of, does that make sense? Good. Energy comes in many different types. How does our body use chemical energy? <clears throat> Question more. Any, any answer to that? Exercise. Exercise. Are you in the second one? The second yeah, the second, the number three. Yeah. Uh, which body system utilizes electrical energy heavily? The nervous system. 
Yeah, uh huh? No, I was going to say the nervous system. Oh, okay, the nervous system. And then how do you um, see, how does your body use the chemical energy? The, the, the chemical energy, um, it's more like the metabolism. It's the eating, the food going in, then making ATP out of it, that kind of stuff. And the mechanical energy is the exercise, the moving, the physical doing stuff. All right, so let's go back to the quiz. This, um... Wait, can you explain the, the sorry. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The mechanical energy. Can you that's the moving things, like mechanically moving things, like contracting a muscle. That's so mechanical. Like the heart, right? The heart's mechanical energy, absolutely. Oh. Mm -hmm, absolutely, the heart pumps, physically pumps. Yeah. That's mechanical. Okay. That's not elect. That's not electrical. That's the wire things going through, mm -hmm. and it's not chemical because. It's a physical thing. The chemical is more like you get the food broken down into energy. That's the chemical thing. Right? I know, it's low stuff. That stuff, that those, I mean, that's, you know, it's important. But the, the, the chemical chapter is more here that we can get the framework of what things we talk about in class. It's not that crucial for me, uh, you know, that you know, it all too detailed. The detail I'm presenting you is good enough. Uh, changing the type of energy is generally smooth. For example, potential one chemical energy in your muscle become kinetic chemical energy as soon as you or your brain decides to move. Energy conversions produces a byproduct that the body can make good use of. For example, when you shiver, we get warm. What is lost during energy conversion? Heat. Heat. That's right. Oh, look, we haven't even gone to the, to the pictures yet. Here are the pictures. Ta -da. The beginning stuff is simple. Mm -hmm. Energy conversion, there is where that is. Oops, it's a little delayed. And then we're going to get to the atoms. All right, so that's where we are. Let's go to the atoms here. Let's go back to matter and understand a few things, how it is made up. The universe is made up of many different elements. To study how these elements work and how they are made up, we look at their smallest possible form and learn to understand that. What do we call one element's fundamental particle? An atom. So when we now look at an atom, um, inside an atom, so this is an atom, and inside an atom, we got different parts. So let's go to those different parts. Uh, the particles are made up of similar in our solar system, or at least that's we're kind of explaining it. So at the center, the nucleus, which is kind of like the sun, then there is things uh, encircling the center, just like planets. What do we call the three tiny substances that make up the nucleus and the orbits? Orbit means the surrounding thing. Mm -hmm. Good. Electron, neutron, and proton. So we got <clears throat> the inside is proton has a positive, so it's a, it's a particle and it has a positive charge. So it's a plus. Positive charge is like in a magnet on the fridge. You know, it glues onto it or it falls away. Positive, negative charge. And so the proton is positive charge. Then it has a second particle in there, the yellow one here, and that's a neutron. And I remember that neutron, neutron. And that has no charge. That's the second particle there. And then on the outside in the orbit, we got <clears throat> the electrons. And I guess I th I'm thinking of them buzzing around, they are electricity. But they have a negative charge. And they are actually almost not particles, they're just sort of energy fields. And so, you know, then this model over time becomes sort of obsolete and it's not longer how we actually really learn it in chemistry, but for our fundamental understanding, I think it's a very good model to start with, to understand. And for our body stuff, it's good enough. I don't want to go any further than that. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Good. Let's see what's next. Molecules, nah, not so far. Not so fast. Many things in our world are based on two opposites, night, day, hot, cold, on, off, etc. Atoms are structurally held together by interaction of charges, a positive charge, attractive, negative charge one. 
what we just talked about then. Is the nucleus, the atom's nucleus negative? No. No, it's positive. So the nucleus is positive, the outside stuff is negative. Combining atoms with one another makes molecules. Water, for example, has three atoms combining. Two hydrogens and one oxygen. How are those atoms, how those atoms combine is interesting. Which part of an atom takes part in creating these links or bonds with another atom? Electrons. The electrons. So in some ways, makes sense when you think about it. The inside is sort of like on the inside and then there's things swirling around on the outside. The out, those, those things on the outside will touch each other and so they're gonna make these interactions with one another. Um, so that, and the molecule basically is just a description of atoms bonded together. So if it's one atom, it's an atom. If it's more than one atom, we call it a molecule, as far as we're concerned here. And then uh, chemical reactions in the body are uh, known as the word metabolism. So the word metabolism means every chemical reaction in the body, basically. It's a superseding term for that. All right. Let's do a couple more of these, I believe. The outermost orbit of one of an atom most likely touch and interact with the ones of another atom. What is the outermost orbit of an atom called? Valence. Valence. So it's, that's just the term. That's just the word we have to start learn. The valence. There it is. That makes sense? So when you look at the, the rings or the areas around the nucleus, the outermost area will most likely be where we have these chemical reactions. So that's where it is, and that's called the, va the valence. Uh, we also then have the octet rule. Let's see if there's a question about the octet rule. Most atoms are, yeah, look at that. Most atoms uh, seem to like eight electrons in their valence, the outermost, and that's the octet rule. So eight electrons in the outermost shell <coughs> make them unreactive. So if they don't have eight, well, let me back up a little bit. Because one thing besides that we kind of want to know. We have different shell layers. And as a matter of fact, the, the inside shell always has two electrons. That's just the way it is. But as we get further out, they carry eight electrons in a shell. And once that is filled, they have to put on another shell with then more electrons. And so the outermost shell most likely does not have just right eight electrons. It most likely has one, two, or seven, or an odd even number, or a non-eight number. And so eight, having, having eight in one of these shells, they call that the octet rule. So that eight satisfy the shell, then we make the next shell. All right, and so then we have, we do have some atoms, they naturally, uh, have eight in them. What do we call? And, and so therefore, they are not reactive. What that means? Their their shell has eight in them. When a shell has eight in them, it's satisfied. It's happy. It doesn't want to do anything. If it doesn't have eight, it's not quite happy. It's something's missing. And so that makes them bonds with another one that has something missing. It's kind of like humans, I guess. Um, what do we call one that has all the electrons filled? It's just happy the way it is. You know. Exactly. Good. You know that already. Um, chemical bonds of connection between atoms are done by either sharing the electrons of the vein of another uh, atom's valence, of each other's valence, or fully transferring one electron from one atom to another. If one uh, uh, atom gets an electron and the other one doesn't, we are making salts, like table salts. That's what that is. When you put salts in the water, they separate and become charged ions in a solution, so that they become fluid, actually. You know that, when you put salt into water, it's gonna dissolve. That's what that means, basically. Um, and then in water, then you drink that salt water, it's like, Eesh. tastes weird, but it's actually an ionic solution, we call it. So it's like electrolytes. When you, you know the emergency things you can buy in the store, you put it in water and you don't shake it, but you swirl it and drink it, that's a lot of vitamin B. Uh, but it's also a lot of electrolytes in there. So it balances out the water ionic imbalance a little bit. And so that's what we're talking about here. Um, so they separate when we put them in water. 
and become charged ions, which in the body help us, for example, make electrical currents, because it's, it's charged. So what do we call uh, that kind of bond? Ionic bond. And then, what's the sharing type called? Covalent, good. That's the one between more one electrons become a double or even triple bonds. When it's more than one, the molecule lose their ability to rotate around an axis. We see that the difference between fats and oils. Well, we're gonna talk about that. So that's the covalent bond. Let's look at that a little bit here. That's a periodic table, it's good. We do no chemistry, so you don't have to memorize it. You just look it up if you need anything from it, which you probably don't. But here are the two big chemical type bonds, the ionic bond, which is the transfer of an electron, the stealing or you know donating of a whole electron, or then the covalent bond, which is sharing it and holding hands with it. The, these dissociated liquids, so they become ions, that's the electrolytes, and these, they're holding hands, they're strong, they're like the fats, for example, or the sugars, the glucoses, uh, that are covalently bonded. And then, when we look at the covalent bond, we can have polar and nonpolar, and I think that's the next question probably, uh, the sharing of the electrons between the two atoms does not have to be equal. One pull of an atom can be stronger than another. So that's what, for example, happens with water. That becomes a polar, covalently bonded molecule. Um, then, yeah, that's the charge or not, right here. Uh, water ions, for example, are attract, attached with a charge bond to the oxygen molecule. These molecules have more positivity and more negative areas. Water molecules are the most interesting because then they also use that unequal quality to make their own reconnection between uh, more positive areas of the water on one the water with the negative one of the other one. What do we call those bonds? Hydrogen bonds. And we use those bonds, for example, and you can see that the tension that it can exude when you see an animal walking on water, one of those little critters, they don't fall in. There's a little tension there. Um, and we can use that little tension, for example, in the DNA double helix, that, you know, you know that's really thing, right? We're going to talk about that, I guess, Monday? Yeah, today's Wednesday. And the Two, so basically when you look at the double helix, you've got two single helices, two, two single strands that go, you know, that you can separate, and they have these rungs that come halfway into the middle. But in there, on the other side, the other one comes in halfway into the middle. And they're attached with each other with a hydrogen bond. And they very easily, with, a, with an enzyme, you can unzip them and separate them, and then bring them back together with that attraction of that, you know, uneven pulling force, that hydrogen bond. And you need to do that because the genetic information is basically a cookbook of how to make proteins in the body. And you know, muscle is protein and albumin, I mean, there are a lot of things are protein in the body, tons of things. And the information of how to make those proteins is located on one of those strands with these things that come into the middle. Nucleotides, they call them. We're going to talk about that on Monday. And so you have to unzip it, copy it, make protein, and then you can use the protein. So that's one reason why we need to have a bond that is not as strong as a covalent bond, and it's not an ionic bond because that's completely useless in liquid in terms of that kind of stuff. But it is a zipping, unzipping, so it's a sort of a weak link. And so it's kind of cool how the body makes use of all these kind of you know, chemical and physical forces that come upon it. Uh, upon it. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. If not, you speak up. Or you talk to me later, that's good too. Uh, chemical reactions generally have two types. They're either built or destroyed. Making a muscle, for example, requires the body to synthesize or build protein. It does that by taking the necessary elements and bonding them together. We call this an anabolic process. Is that true or false? True. 
What's the other one? Catabolic. catabolic. So when we look at the catabolic pathway, we decompose things and go into your garden and you find a compost. That's decomposition of your food. So we break down the food in our digestive tract, for example, with chewing them and putting chemicals on them and, and break and make them small enough. But that's decomposition, small, from a bigger to a smaller. And then we have them small enough, we can get these molecules into the bloodstream through the gut wall. We absorb them. And then there we can use those little building blocks to make things. And that's the making protein. And so that's uh, the synthesis reaction. We also have an exchange reaction, like a molecular switch. For example, when glucose goes into the cell, um, it attaches an other little uh, atom, particle, onto it that it takes from, an order, from an ATP, which is that energy molecule we talked about already. We'll talk much more about that. And so it goes from glucose plus ATP to glucose plus, and then it's ADP. And the T stands for tri, three, and the D stands for two, phosphate. And so the one phosphate switches over to glucose. And we need that to basically trap the glucose in the cell once it enters the cell, so it doesn't go back out. And also the other reason why we need it is the way the glucose goes into the cell, we'll talk about that in the cell chapter in a week. The way the glucose goes into the cell, it's sort of like, almost like a little vacuum. It gets sucked in because there's so much more glucose on the outside, but not enough on the inside. And, and, and the particles want to go to the area where there is less concentration. Right? And so if every glucose that comes into the cell will add a phosphate to it, it's no longer a glucose. But the body thinks, oh, it's an empty space, and so more glucose wants to come in. So it's kind of an ingenious kind of thing, what they do. We'll talk more about that when we talk about um, transport of molecules across the cell membrane. It'll be interesting, it'll be very interesting. We'll talk about active processes and passive processes. They use ATP or they don't. So anyway, that's enough of that stuff. And then let's see where we are. The body uses molecules called enzymes to help specific chemical reactions. Enzymes help in making and breaking bonds. What other factors influence the rate of chemical reactions? Concentration? Everything. All of them, huh? Uh-oh. Bad result. Hello. <laughs> The interesting there is really the enzyme. You know, we can understand if we have more concentration, there's more ability to bump into each other for molecules. If we have more temperature, it's like in humans. It gets too hot, go. I mean, this summer on the freeway sometimes, you know, there's this level of temperature goes up, you better don't go on the freeway, people go crazy. Or the cars at least go crazy and they break down. Um, particle size also is kind of logical, but the biological catalyst is kind of the goofy one. And what that does, that's an enzyme. So whenever you hear the word enzyme, you think of this. It helps speed up a chemical reaction. So what it does, when you have a molecule, these are like molecules, it's actually a dissect two sugars, so a table sugar. And then inside the body, we have to separate the table sugar, which is two glucose types, the fructose and the glucose. We have to separate it into the individual ones. And so you could like wait and maybe put some heat on it and, until these bonds break up. And so these two molecules split apart. Or you can make a molecule that can go on and, and it fits right into it and it starts chewing away on the bond and it starts breaking that bond, and when it breaks that bond, it then splits it off and lets it go. And that's an enzyme. And so when we look at the chemical reaction, we have a, a reactant, and we want a product of the chemicals, and we have energy input, and we have time. So this, if you want to boil an egg, you know, no, you want to make a fried egg, you, you first, you, it's clear, red, yellow, and clear, and then after a while of the heat, it gets white. Have you ever wondered about that? It's weird, right? What parts of the egg get white? It's a protein, it's albumin, it, de it denatures. And what it does is the heat breaks the bonds, 
so it destroys the protein, but it still it breaks bonds. And so the heat gets inputted and speeds up that the, the, the clear becomes white and it destroys it. And so we can use that same concept with the heat and instead of heat, we put an enzyme in and it does the same thing. So you can kind of think like the enzyme is like a heating plane, helping out to speed up a chemical reaction. And it puts this energy in instead of heat, it's the enzyme, but it's still energy and it, that's called activation energy. And so that helps initiate the reaction and then the reaction goes past it. So once these bones are a little bit chewed on, it goes automatically, passively means automatically. So that's what that graph looks like. So pro the enzymes, you think of that, they're always doing that. They're always helping speed up chemical reactions. Did you know that? Good, good. So I'm not just telling you things you already know. That's good. Cool. Hmm? I thought enzymes helped break down your food. Well, that's the same thing. Okay, okay. That's exactly, if you take stomach enzyme stuff, that's exactly what it does. It, it's, uh, it helps. A lot, of, a lot of enzymes are in the gut. Isn't it in here too? Like yeah, the amylase is in the mouth. It breaks it down. So the, the, gluc, the carbohydrate gets broken down in your saliva stuff. And then in the stomach, you get the pepsin which is the, the, the protein denaturing and all that. And then further down, you get all these other enzymes that have all different names, but they always end, the name always ends in the ASE, like amylase, ASE. Most, pro, most enzymes, when you see ASE at the end of a word, you think is an enzyme, More, most likely is an enzyme. Uh, carbon, let's, let me go and move on from that now. Carbon is one of the most important elements for us on Earth. It's found in all living things. Molecules forming with carbon are generally large. What are these types of molecules called? Organic molecules. Yeah, God, that was too simple. There we go. Inorganic or small not containing carbon. Organic or large containing carbon. Organic, you think carbohydrates, fats, and protein. And then nucleotides. But that, you know, those are the main ones. Then if we talk about food next week, basically, because that's what that is about. H2O is the most common molecule. Whoop, there it is. In our body, it fills us up to the armpits. Life really, oh God, it's not me. Life really the, uh, came from the oceans. It's like we are ocean with a skin suit around it. Oh yeah, I remember explaining it that way. I try to remember that when I drink water, so to drink more water, and it is like that. I mean, there is a need for us to get water from the outside in, and then the skin holds it in, because we are a bag of water. Can you list and explain the properties that make up H2O, such as a, make it such a superstar molecule? Explain? Oh, well, you didn't have to write anything down, so that's good. So what are it? Huh? Cushioning, polarity. They're pretty much all of them, right? Except for extensibility. I have to look that one up. Uh, there it is. Cushioning, chemical reactivity, heat capacity, and polarity, not extensibility. Heat capacity, you notice when you're up by the ocean, the temperature, much more, is, the temperature is much more balanced than if you go inland. A large body of water balances out temperature in the air. So that's where you see, that's the heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to change temperature in water. It takes much less energy to change the air. You can put a, high, a, a light bulb on, you stand on it, it gets warm real fast. You put that thing over, it's gonna take a long time till the water heats up. That's what that means. So that's very interesting. It's good for us to have that because it's a balancer of, all, of, of the heat, for example, the water that we have on the inside. So that goes for that. I like my water. Salts are very important for our bodies. They are particles that carry a charge. We can use them to make small electrical impulses. Nerve, for example, use that to send signals to the body. What do we call a solution filled with these ions? Electrolyte, Electrolyte solution. We talked about that briefly. There are your salts. Sodium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, potassium. Make sure you have enough magnesium. That's one of the ones we kind of get efficient at. And it balances out a lot of things. Actually, I don't know what all it does. But like I have a magnesium spray that I got at Sprouts. You got a paint, spray it on, rub it in. 
goes away. It's magic. And well, at least for a lot of the pains. Um, it's kind of like Epsom salt. You heard of Epsom salt bath? It's got that same kind of effect. There's a magnesium in there that has the effect. So, you know, sodium, we don't want, we already have enough sodium in our diet. But originally, sodium, the reason why we crave sodium so much, the salty stuff, is because we need it so much. It's just we have an overabundance at this point, and so we need to be careful about how much we take in, and we have too much that we take in. So then it raises blood pressure and all kind of stuff. But, and you get most of sodium that's too much you get in the food that you buy uh, that's prepared. At restaurant food or prepackaged food. If you make your food from scratch and you sprinkle a little salt on top, that's not the problematic salt amount. It's the one that's in the other people making it for you. Because it makes it more yummy, so they put more in, so you know, you want it again. It's very logical. It's good to, we gotta do it in organic chemistry. Oh, that's next week. Oh yeah, um, For make sure you let me know, get away with it. For next week, I need you to take five pictures each of food labels of foods you eat. Be honest though, you can share the one, you only gotta do one as a group, I think. You share the one that's the least, uh, least bad. But you know, and then we got a few things I wanna learn, I want us to focus on analyzing a food label a little bit. Because I don't look at it, generally speaking. I gotta remind myself to look at it. Yeah. So in one of your videos that I scanned, I was watching this, and you said something about, you um, we were talking about electrolytes, and you mentioned the Gators team before the Gatorade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, I know we drink water when we exercise, and when we're sick, we're supposed to stay hydrated and drink water, but when you drink Gatorade, you actually do feel better. So. Yeah, it's because your sweat is electrolytes. Is it good? You never said it was good or not good for you. Well, I, you know, the problem with Gatorade is all the sugar in it. That's the problem. So the sports drinks, they're unfortunately fattening drinks because they have a lot of sugar. So Serena Williams, she don't drink that stuff. She just gets money for doing the advertising. And um, so I, but I like the electrolyte stuff. So like in emergencies, like emergencies, or these other things you can get everywhere at this point, sort of electrolyte solutions that have a little vi half vitamin C in and the B vitamins also. I think those are fantastic if, you're, if your stomach can take it. Sometimes the vitamin C is hard on the stomach. But, you know, Linus Pauling who figured out vitamin C, he titrated the level of how much you can take by taking a gram more every day until he had the diarrhea and then he went back a couple of Because <laughs> it upsets the stomach. So, but, you know, with one gram, which is usually what's in them, that's usually okay. And then you, you, I think there's not as much sugar in those things. And they're pretty tasty. The orange, I like the orange one. But Gatorade, I would stay away from Gatorade. And I, I have not drank the Gatorade in a long time. Because basically you can drink Coke, unfortunately. But it is come from, and it does make you feel better. You know, it does have a hydrating effect. But it's just the sugar is the problem. Now, if you run like a football person, no problem. There's a lot, of, a lot of energy that you need to burn, so sugar is all right. Good. The gators, yeah, back when they were good. I don't think they exist. Hmm? I've never even heard of football team with gators. Well, they were good in the 70s. Salt, important. They are particular. Did we do that? Yeah. Yes. Almost there. H2O is, is everywhere in the body. That means it's higher than that. If they split off from other molecules, so the H2O split off from the other molecules and throw freely in, freely in solution, they float in there as a hydrogen ion, an H plus, or a hydroxyl ion, which is an OH minus. Those two stick together. They can become dangerous because if, if the concentration is too high. Acids, oh, this is where acids come in. Acids give off hydrogen ions easily and bases hydroxyl ions. pH measures the concentration of, um, pH measures their concentration. Does a pH of two mean a solution is basic? No. Means it's what? The acidic. acidic. So that's, this is a tough concept, this basis. Did you kind of get that, the way we, I talked about it in there? Not really. Okay. So, 
You know about acids and bases, right? From the ammonia and you know the lemon juice kind of thing. So in the body, we have substances that, like, you know, if somebody drinks coffee all day long, your body's going to get more acidic on the inside. It's just, and then, you know, then you have fibromyalgia and your muscles are already contract. There's no, you got to think about that. There's a connection, most likely. Um, but it's when hydrogen ions split off from a water molecule, and we get them alone in solution, these hydrogen ions alone. That becomes an acidic solution that kind of wears on the tissues or abruptly changes metabolisms like the, the release of oxygen that comes from the, high, from, the, um, from the red blood cell to the tissues. That doesn't flow as easily anymore. Stuff like that gets influenced. It's very toxic for the body when we have too high of concentrations of either just hydrogen ions alone, the H2s, those, those atoms, or ions they're called because they're not, they have a, 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 an electron missing, or the hydroxyl ions alone. And so we want to keep those concentrations balanced out because they're toxic for the system when they are in solution alone. And so we do that, we do that with buffers. See here, for example, if you have a pH so the pH measures, you've heard of that before, pH 7 is neutral, have you heard of that before? And then you know the alkaline water is pH or pH, although I'm not so sure what it does if it just goes through the stomach, which is very acidic. But that's a different story, it tastes good at least, right? Uh, but if we have inside the body tissues, we have uh, a pH of 7.2 instead of 7.4, a decrease in pH there of that little actually tells, I said it wrong before, but it, it, it up, that tells the red blood cell that the tissue needs more oxygen because when you make energy from oxygen, you create more acidity, more hydrogen ions that get freed up. And so that little difference in pH changes that the oxygen is released really much faster into the tissues than if it's higher when we don't need it because it's more basic. Not as acidic. So that tells you if that point two makes that difference, if we change it on the scale on a one or so, we're going to be dead. It's way too much. And so we have to be making sure. The least I want you to understand from this is that it's concentrations of hydrogen ions or hydroxyl ions, these OHs. You don't have to know the word hydroxyl. OH negative is fine. Uh, but it's that water that splits up, and when there are high concentrations of the two, they are bad for the body. The H's are the acids and the OH's are the uh, bases. And we don't want too much of a swing of them because they tear the body apart. And what we have is we have buffers in the system that balance out those concentrations fluctuations so the body stays nice and balanced and doesn't get out of hand. And actually it's bicarbonate is the big one that we use. So a weak acid and a weak base can balance out and flip back and forth, accept hydrogen ions or not, or release them. And so whatever needs to be done. And bicarbonate ions is the one that we understand from, that's in Alka-Seltzer. If you ever had an Alka-Seltzer. That's the thing that balances out the stomach acid because it's a weak base that attracts a hydrogen ion. So your stomach is upset. The bicarbonate that you drink is going to calm that down because it attracts that hydrogen ion. Does the same in the system, in the bloodstream. We have a whole bunch of bicarbonate ions that will balance out that, that, that system, which is really cool, I think. And let's see, that's probably the last question here, right? Ta da! And what is it? A buffer right there. So, does that, that make some sense with that? acid base thing a little bit better we'll keep talking about it but that's kind of you know it's really hard for me even to understand it so you know don't get too troubled with yourself if the level I just told you put that on a flash card and it should be all right <laughs>